10 topics. Let's go. First, let's look at photosynthesis. Let's compare light dependent reaction and the light independent reaction. The similarities between the two. First, we have both processes occur in the chloroplast. Both take place in the chloroplast and both are catalyzed by enzymes. Now, the differences between light dependent and light independent reaction is the site of reaction. First of all, even though both take place in the chloroplast, light dependent reaction happens in the thylakoids, whereas light independent reaction occurs in the stroma. And the process in the light dependent reaction is the photolysis of water, the breaking down of water, whereas the process in the light independent reaction is the reduction of carbon dioxide. From this, you can know the reaction substances, which is for the light dependent reaction, it is water because it's the photolysis of water. And for light independent, it's carbon dioxide because we are reducing carbon dioxide. And the product for light dependent reaction is oxygen and water, whereas the product for light independent reaction is the reduction of carbon dioxide is to glucose. And so we have glucose. ATP molecules are produced in the light dependent reaction, whereas ATP molecules are used up in the light independent reaction. And the requirement of light, light dependent, therefore requires light. Light independent does not require light. Let's talk about compensation points. What are the keywords that you need to use here? So first of all, compensation point is the light intensity when the rate of respiration is equal to the rate of photosynthesis. And as such, the rate of absorption and release of carbon dioxide, the absorption of carbon dioxide and release of carbon dioxide happens at the same rate. And so the glucose produced is also used up at the same rate because glucose is produced during photosynthesis and used up during respiration. And therefore, there is no excess glucose. Nothing is left. Everything is used up and there will be no growth in the plant. For there to be growth, the rate of photosynthesis has to be higher than the rate of respiration. Let's compare photosynthesis and respiration. So the similarities between the two is both occur in living organisms and both involve the exchange of gases. The differences between them is the organisms involved. In photosynthesis, it only involves plants as well as photosynthetic bacteria. It has to be green plants. And respiration involves all living organisms. The site of photosynthesis is, as we discussed earlier, in the chloroplast, whereas for respiration, it is in the mitochondrion. The reaction substance here is carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water is used up during photosynthesis, whereas in respiration, it is glucose and oxygen that is used up. Whereas the products are the opposite. The reaction substance for respiration is the product of photosynthesis, and therefore carbon dioxide and water turns to glucose and oxygen. And the reaction substance for photosynthesis is the product of respiration. They are the opposite processes. And so the product for respiration will be carbon dioxide and water. And the energy conversion involved in photosynthesis is the light energy is converted into chemical energy. Whereas for respiration, the energy conversion is from chemical energy in stored in the glucose to ATP and heat energy is released as well. Let's compare gene mutation and chromosomal mutation. So the types of gene mutation, we have three. There is base deletion, base insertion, and base substitution. Everything involves just a single base. Whereas in chromosomal mutation, we have deletion, duplication, inversion, and translocation, DDIT. Whereas for gene mutation is DIS. The mutation that occurs in gene mutation is a change in the nucleotide base sequence of a gene. The sequence of the gene is changed by only one base. Whereas in chromosomal mutation, it is a change in the chromosomal structure or number involving more than just a single base. The disease caused by gene mutation examples are thalassemia, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, albinism, as well as cystic fibrosis. Whereas for chromosomal mutation, we have Down syndrome, Friedreich-Chart syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome, Turner syndrome, and Jacob syndrome. Let's look at insulin production through genetic engineering. The first step is we have to get the insulin gene from the human DNA. So we cut the insulin gene using a restriction enzyme. This is what we'll get. And then you have to cut a plasmid from bacteria using the same restriction enzyme. So this is a plasmid and it is cut using the same restriction enzyme. So you can see now we have a space to fit this in. And so that's exactly what we do. DNA ligase, DNA ligase acts like the glue. DNA ligase is used to combine the cut human gene and the cut plasmid. And so what we end up with is this thing here. This is called a recombinant plasmid. 
and the recombinant plasmid is introduced into the bacteria. You put it into the bacteria. So now this recombinant plastic contains the gene to produce human insulin, which is in the bacteria now. And what happens is a transgenic bacteria is produced. And so this transgenic bacteria produces human insulin because now it contains the gene to produce insulin. So all we have to do now is culture the bacteria. The bacteria is cultured and it multiplies and insulin is extracted from the bacteria. Let's look at body temperature regulation. First, let's start with what happens when the body temperature increases. So when the body temperature increases, we always start with detection. So if it's detected by thermoreceptors, the type of receptors, and where are these thermoreceptors located? They are located in the skin as well as in the hypothalamus. So what happens is there are two responses. That is either by physical method or chemical method. Let's look at physical method first. The physical method of response to an increased body temperature is first, the erector muscle is stimulated less. This erector muscle is for the hair on the skin. So what happens when it's stimulated less? It doesn't contract. When it doesn't contract, the hair lies flat on the skin and air is not trapped. So there is no insulation. When there is no insulation, heat is released quickly. These are arterioles near the skin. What happens to the arterioles? Vasodilation occurs of the arterioles near the skin. So what happens is more blood flows to the skin surface and blood contains the heat in our body because blood is made mostly of water. It has a high specific heat capacity. What happens is more heat is radiated to the surrounding because now the blood is close to the skin. It is easy for heat to be radiated out. This is the sweat gland. So what happens when it's very hot? Sweat gland is stimulated and so sweat is produced. What is the use of sweat? When sweat evaporates from the skin, heat is absorbed. What happens to our skeletal muscles? The skeletal muscles are less stimulated to contract and relax. They are not really stimulated to contract and relax when it's very hot. So what happens is no shivering occurs. So no heat is generated. Let's look at the chemical methods. For the chemical methods, there are two involved, two organs involved. That is the adrenal glands and the thyroid gland. When it is hot, the adrenal gland is stimulated less. And when it's stimulated less, it produces less adrenaline. And adrenaline, of course, is responsible for the metabolic rate. And so when less adrenaline is secreted, the metabolic rate is low. What happens in the thyroid gland? It is less stimulated as well. And so thyroid gland is producing thyroxine. So less thyroxine is produced. Metabolic rate is low as well. And so no excess heat is generated. What happens when the body temperature decreases instead? So first, it is detected by the same thing, the thermoreceptors in the skin and the hypothalamus. And this produces two types of response. That is either through the physical method or chemical method again. So we're going to look at the same organs that are involved. So first, we have the erector pili muscle. This time, when it is cold, the erector muscle is stimulated. When the erector muscle is stimulated, this is the erector muscle. So it contracts and the hair stands erect because the muscle is pulling on it, tugging on it. So what happens when the hair stands erect, air is trapped and it acts as an insulator. It acts like an invisible sweater on the skin. And so what happens is, this prevents heat loss to the surrounding. Now what happens to the arterioles? As you can see, they're much thinner now. So the process here is called vasoconstriction. The arterioles near the skin are constricted. And so what happens is, less blood is now flowing to the surface of the skin. And so since less blood flows to the surface, less heat is radiated to the surrounding. More heat is retained inside the body. Less is given away. When it's cold, the sweat glands are not stimulated. And so no sweat is produced. What about the muscles? The skeletal muscles are stimulated to contract and relax. This causes shivering. The body shivers. And when the body shivers, heat is generated in the body. The chemical methods are carried out by the same two glands. The adrenal gland is stimulated so that more adrenaline is secreted. And what does adrenaline do? More glycogen is converted to glucose so that this glucose can be used in metabolism, in respiration. So increased metabolic rate and heat is generated through the metabolic activity. A similar story occurs in thyroid gland as well. Thyroid gland is stimulated so more thyroxine is secreted. When thyroxine is secreted, metabolic rate increases and more heat is generated by the body. Let's look at homeostasis. Let's look at blood pressure regulation this time. So there are two situations. Number one is when the blood pressure increases. When the blood pressure increases, it is detected by baroreceptors. Blood pressure is detected by baroreceptors. And where are the baroreceptors located? As you can see here, 
they are located on the aortic arch as well as the carotid artery the carotid artery is here these are the carotid arteries so the baroreceptors are constantly stimulated by blood pressure so when the blood pressure is high then they are more stimulated so the baroreceptors generate nerve impulse and sends the nerve impulse to the cardiovascular center control center in the medulla oblongata and what happens as a result of that vasodilation occurs the blood vessel expands so vasodilation occurs and as a result of vasodilation so you can see the lumen here is very big as a result of vasodilation there is lower resistance to blood flow and there is a weak contraction of cardiac muscles two responses and as a result of that blood pressure returns to normal what happens when blood pressure decreases also detected by the baroreceptors but now they are less stimulated so when they are less stimulated they are also located the same baroreceptors so they are still in the aortic arch and the carotid artery but now they are less stimulated when they are less stimulated the cardiovascular control center in the medulla oblongata is also less stimulated as a result of this vasoconstriction occurs the opposite so you can see the lumen here is smaller it is constricted this causes higher resistance to blood flow and stronger contraction of cardiac muscles also occurs together this effect brings about the blood pressure returning to normal it increases back to the normal range let's look at a comparison between vertebrae so for vertebrae in humans that is the cervical vertebrae thoracic vertebrae as well as the lumbar vertebrae we also have the sacrum and the coccyx but we're not going to look at that here let's compare these three the spinous process is short in the cervical vertebrae as well as the lumbar vertebrae cervical vertebrae is up near the neck region lumbar is at the lower back but for the thoracic vertebrae the spinous process is very long in fact it's so long that it bends downwards and the transverse process the process is coming out at the side the transverse process is very wide and short for the cervical vertebrae in the thoracic vertebrae it is long as well and in the lumbar vertebrae it is short all the processes in the lumbar vertebrae are very short the centrum on the other hand the lumbar vertebrae has the largest centrum it's a very large centrum it supports the weight of the upper body then we have a medium sized centrum in thoracic vertebrae in the cervical vertebrae the centrum is very small so you can see as we go from top to bottom the size increases but notably the lumbar is the one that has a very large centrum and the transverse foramen foramens are the holes the holes through which the blood vessels and the nerves go through so these are only present the transverse foramen the four holes at the side are only present in the cervical vertebrae there are two foramina there are no foramina in the thoracic vertebrae and the lumbar vertebrae let's look at the movement of the human forearm so the forearm first we have to recognize our muscles this here is the biceps biceps is singular by the way and this is the triceps singular as well so with the biceps and the triceps this bone right here on the top is the radius the one at the bottom is the ulna and the ulna connects to this bone right here this is known as the funny bone because it is the humerus so what happens when we are trying to bend the forearm when we want to bend the arm so first we have to recognize that the biceps and triceps are antagonistic muscles what's the meaning of antagonistic muscles they are a pair of muscles where when one muscle contracts the other one relaxes and vice versa in the bending of the forearm the biceps is the one that contracts this one contracts so when it contracts you can see it's attached to this this here this white color attachment here is the tendon so when the bicep contracts the pull force is transmitted to the radius through the tendon so you can see the muscle is connected to the bone through the tendon and so this is how the pull force is transmitted and at the same time look at the triceps the triceps relaxes and so this causes the radius which is this bone up here where the tendon is attached to this radius is pulled upwards and this results in the forearm bending what about the straightening instead so the straightening of the forearm the opposite occurs remember they are antagonistic muscles so this time the triceps is the one that contracts when the triceps contracts you can see there is a tendon here that connects to this was the ulna and so what happens is the pull force by the contraction of the triceps is transmitted to the ulna through the tendon and at the same time biceps relaxes because 
they are antagonistic muscles. And so the final effect is that the ulna is pulled downwards. And so the forearm is straightened. All the best guys. If you've learned something from this, please do hit that like button. Don't forget to check out these two videos.